Aloha. How's everybody doing? Thank you for braving the extreme cold, blowing off the world's largest mountain right here. I mean, it's kind of true. <laughs> We're, I don't know about you guys, but I'm loving it. I'm loving the, the cool breezes and just the, the wonderful time to be here together as an ohana. Let's kick on those lights. Let's kick up some sound and let's worship Jesus. How about it?
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. And I am yours. You are mine. Oh, oh, oh. Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign. that your voice would just permeate our very souls tonight. Lord God, that we would 
hear from your heart to ours, God, a little more of who you are, of what your intent is for our lives, God, why we're here on this planet. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak, that you would speak clearly and powerfully, and God, that you would reveal the mysteries of your character, of just this beautiful thing that you are, God. We want to know you more. We want to know you more, God, because we recognize you at work here in our hearts, here in our lives, and we say yes and amen more, Lord. You're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is you.
missing But no one's around I will let go Your lovely sound Sound Lord, it's the sound of your love Jesus, give us another taste. Help us to hear you, to see you, to just be here with you. That's our heart. That's our desire for tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's thank Joel and Al for leading us into the presence of God tonight. Aloha! Brr! It's chilly chilly here in Hawaii tonight. All those of you on the mainland are going, we don't want to hear about it, right? <laughs> so we're glad you guys are with us. We're glad you guys are with us. We're glad those of you who are online are watching tonight as well. I've been chatting with a bunch of you already, and we're glad that you are with us. Don't forget there's three ways to support the church financially. Number one, use the Yay God boxes yeah. out in the lobby. Number two is to use the online giving address that you see on the screen. Number three is you can just send a check to the P.O. box. All three great ways to support the ministry. We appreciate your support. Every single penny helps. So on Palm Sunday and Good Friday, we talked about how Yeshua, Jesus, fulfilled the feasts of Passover and unleavened bread. And we talked about how he did that to the very day, and not just the very day, but also to the very hour. And I've also mentioned that he fulfilled the third of the spring feasts, the Feast of First Fruits. And you'll see in a minute, he did that to the very day and to the very hour as well. And he did that on what we call now Easter Sunday. Now, I didn't have time to cover all this on Easter because the Lord put a different message on my heart to share uh, for Easter. And so for those of you who wanted to hear part three, that's why you're here tonight. That's why you're watching online tonight. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So if you're ready to hear part three, would you do me a favor and say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. So the Feast of First Fruits is known by two different Hebrew names. One is Rashit Katsir, which means the beginning of the harvest. The other name it's known by is Yom Habikarum, which means the day of first fruits. And when we think of the Feast of the Harvest, when we think of the fruit of a harvest, we're reminded of Yeshua's words in John 12. He said, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So this, of course, is Yeshua prophesying his death and his resurrection. He is the grain of wheat that falls to the earth and dies, but then later springs forth in new life. And as he bursts through the soil again, he bears much fruit. And you and I are some of the fruit of his labors. The Apostle Paul used similar terminology in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23. He says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, and he calls him the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So he's talking about by a man came death, that's Adam. Also by a man came the resurrection of the dead, that's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, there he calls him that again. After that, those who are Christ's at his 
coming, that's you and me, we're going to be part of his fruits when he comes again. So Paul calls Yeshua the first fruits twice in this passage. The first fruits of any harvest were just that, the choicest, the best, those that were picked first, the best of the crop, they picked that before they picked anything else. And the idea was that the first fruits were supposed to be given to God as an offering to God, and by doing that, you're acknowledging that all things belong to God. He's the creator of all, everything belongs to him. We're acknowledging that it all belongs to him, and we are just stewards of his universe, stewards of his stuff. We talked about that a lot in our Money Matters series last month. And by the way, that reminds me of a story I heard about God being approached by a scientist once who said, God, we don't really need you anymore because we've learned how to do everything you can do. And God said, oh, really? Do tell. And so the scientist said, well, for example, we can clone humans now. We can make human life just like you did. And God said, wow, that's great. I got an idea. Let's both make a human being with nothing but the dust of the earth right now, okay? You go first. And so the scientist agrees, and he reaches down to grab a handful of dirt, and God stops him and says, uh, 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 get your own dirt. Get your own dirt, all right? When we read the Old Testament, we see when it came to animals, the firstborn of every animal was to be sacrificed to God as a first fruits offering. All the other offspring of that animal for the rest of its life belonged to the people who owned the animal, but the first fruits, the very first one born, that belonged to God. Now, this rule was true of humans as well. The firstborn male offspring belong to God. But what was different is when this law was applied to humans, because God is opposed to human sacrifice, he allowed for an animal to be substituted for the firstborn human male of each family. This is called substitutionary atonement. Somebody's being atoned with a substitute. And it was referred to as being redeemed or purchased back from God. Your life as the first fruits of your parents belonged to God, but he allowed your life to be purchased back, redeemed by the blood of a sacrificed animal. And the same principle applied to plant harvests as well. The first fruits always belong to God, and he allows us to keep all the rest, even though it really all belongs to him. And so when we get that, that everything belongs to God, the creator, not to us, it really changes our mindset about God tithing and offering. It stops being an obligation or a burden, and we begin to realize it's really a great opportunity to worship and glorify God and to become more like him, a great giver. That's what we talked about in the Money Matter series. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was the first harvest of the Jewish religious year, and it happened to be a barley harvest. And like all the harvests, a first fruits offering was required for this harvest, but this was also the very first harvest of of the religious year. So it was special. This first fruits offering got its very own feast designation. Even though it's got its own designation as its own feast, it actually occurs during the feast of unleavened bread. So we've got Passover preparation day, the 14th of Nisan. You've got the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Nisan, and it goes for seven more days. And then on the Sunday that falls within the seven days of the feast of unleavened bread, that day is the feast of first fruits. So it's not always boom, boom, boom right in a row. It just happened to be the year Jesus was crucified. Sometimes that Sunday might have been two, three, four days later. It just happened to be boom, boom, boom right in a row on the 33rd, 33rd year AD is when we think the best example of when Jesus was crucified. So uh, we've got this uh, situation where all three of these feasts happening together over time just sort of began to be referred to as Passover. And even by Jesus's time, they were just calling the whole thing Passover, but it was really three different feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And so I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, but Sunday is happening on the third day of this eight-day feast period, right? It's the third day. It happens to be the 14th, the 15th, and it just happens to be the 16th. So that's why over time the Jews really became uh, convinced this is just one sort of big celebration. So we remember all these festivals, all of these feasts were moed, divine appointments, dress rehearsals, appointments with God for the revealing of their ultimate meaning, it doesn't surprise us that this one occurs related to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Yeshua. So let's look at Leviticus 23. God gives the command for the Israelites to uh, do this particular festival, to observe it. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, 
Then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, to the high priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So it's going to be on a Sunday, right? It's the day after the Sabbath. Now, on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma, with its drink offering a fourth of a hen of wine. Until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. So God tells Moses, bring in the sheaf of the first fruits to the high priest. The priest is going to wave this sheaf around in the air, much the same way we might wave our hands in worship, yeah? He waves it in all directions to show that God is the king of the universe and everything as he does this blessing, this offering of the first fruits. And we say, now what is a sheaf? Well, a sheaf is just a group of grain stalks. It can be as small as a handful or a big group of stalks, as big as a person, even bigger. And they bundle all of these grain stalks together like a bouquet of flowers, but this is kind of a bouquet of grain. So we're going to put on the screen, you see a couple of pictures. One is a handful size sheaf, right? Somebody's holding a sheaf in their hand and a whole field of person-sized sheaves that they've bought, piled together. So here's something you might remember. If you read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, he had a prophetic dream one time where he was a sheaf of grain, like a big, you know, human-sized sheaf of grain. And in his dream, all of his brothers were also sheaves of grain, and they all came and bowed down before him, which he interpreted as one day that's really going to happen, and sure enough, it did. So this is just one example from Scripture where sheaves are used symbolically to represent people. So just like matzah, we'll see that the Feast of First Fruits sheaf has always been a symbol for Yeshua as well. How many of you remember the old hymn, Bringing in the Sheaves, right? You remember that song? Yeah, that, let's sing it with me if you remember. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, right? So that song is really talking about sowing seeds of kindness for the master, and then the seeds grow, and the harvest is ready, and we bring in the sheaves to the master. It was written by this guy, Noel Shaw. Now, Noel Shaw was inspired to write this song from the giant sheaf that was growing out of his chin. That is some beard, man. No, he was actually inspired to write this hymn by Psalm 126.6, which says, He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So this is ultimately talking about planting the seeds of the gospel and seeing a harvest come from all of that planting. It's very similar to Yeshua's parable of the sower, right? Some of the seed fell on good soil and produced a great harvest. And so Yeshua says the seed represents the word of God and the harvest is a harvest of souls for God, people who will be granted eternal life. So with all that in mind, let's get back to this festival that God ordains called the Feast of First Fruits. He says nobody can continue to harvest or prepare or eat any of the barley grain of this harvest until after the sheaf of first fruits has been waved before the Lord in the temple. So let's talk for a few minutes about how this wave offering was historically practiced by the high priest. As the Sabbath day was ending, Saturday night, at sunset on the Sabbath, and the day of first fruits was beginning, which is Sunday, the high priest would send out a delegation to the nearby barley fields, and they would grab a sheaf of barley grain, and they would bring it back to the temple in preparation for the wave offering, which would happen at 9 a.m. the coming morning during the daily morning sacrifice. This is what's happening on the Feast of First Fruits, which happened to be the very next day after the Sabbath that year. But again, it was whichever Sunday occurred during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the Feast of First Fruits. It could have happened a couple of days later. It just happened to happen, bang, 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 right in a row on the day, the year that Jesus was crucified. So remember, the Jewish day starts and ends at sunset. I know this can get a little confusing, so I want to go slow with this, make sure we all really get this. So let's say sunset was at 6.40 p.m. I don't know when it was back then, but let's say it was 6.40 p.m. It's about when it's happening here this time of year. So at 6.39 p.m. Saturday, 
it's still the Sabbath day, what we would call Saturday. Then the sun sets at 6.40 p.m., and now it is the day after the Sabbath day. It's the first day of the week to the Jews. We would say, well, the first day of the week, that's Sunday, but we don't think that begins until at least after midnight, right? But they would say, no, as soon as the sun went down, it's the first day of the week. So we would say, no, that's still Saturday night, but the Jews would say, no, it's the first minutes of the first day of the week. Follow that? So technically, anything after 6.40 p.m., after sunset, on that Sabbath day, is now considered the Feast of First Fruits Day, and in this case, on this particular year, it was also the first day of the week. Now, it, well, it would have always been the first day of the week, but again, it's just bang, 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 happened right and around. Now, what time was Yeshua resurrected? Most people would say dawn. He was resurrected at dawn. He was resurrected at daybreak. He was resurrected at sunrise on Easter morning. That's kind of the tradition in the church, right? The tradition of the resurrection happening right at dawn, including the idea of having a sunrise uh, watching service for the coming dawn, all of that actually comes from the merging of the resurrection celebration with a pagan festival that worshipped a fertility goddess named Yoster, the goddess of the dawn. And that's why our secular celebrations of Easter include bunnies and colored eggs as well, by the way. That's the, the fertility side of it. So that ancient pagan feast to Yoster was scheduled to begin at sunrise on the first Sunday after the first full moon that occurred on or after the spring equinox. Sound familiar? That's exactly how we determine when Easter occurs on our Gregorian calendar. And so as a result, sometimes we celebrate Easter the resurrection of Jesus, a month before we celebrate Passover, the crucifixion of Jesus. Isn't that crazy? And then the same thing happened with Christmas when the Roman Empire and the Roman Church merged and the pagan feast of Saturnalia got merged with Christianity. Now, Saturnalia was a festival of lights in honor of the Roman god Saturn. It was held in the days leading up to the winter solstice where they celebrated the birthday of the unconquerable sun, S-U-N, sun. And then on December 25th, the darkest, shortest day of the year, the 21st, had turned to light and had begun to increase again towards spring. And so this pagan feast was merged with the Christian's desire to honor the birth of the Messiah, who is the unconquerable son, S-O-N, of God, the light of the world who shines in the darkness, right? So I've shared many, many times, Yeshua was not born on December 25th, his birth had nothing to do with evergreen trees or holly bushes or mistletoe. He was actually born on the first night of the fall feast of Sukkot, which occurs on September 20th this year. I say a lot more about this in the Divine Appointment series on the website if you want to dig in deeper. Hopefully COVID world will end and we'll get to have a big Sukkot celebration this year. That's a big hope that our council has. If you would be excited to be part of a Sukkot celebration, would you say yeah, God? So to merge the pagans into the new religion, official religion of the Roman Empire, Christianity, things were just kind of mixed together to try to make everybody happy. That happened with Easter, and it happened with the resurrection. Dawn was a big deal in the worship of this fertility goddess, Yoster. But is that when Yeshua was resurrected as well? Well, we always want to turn to Scripture, right? What does Scripture say? And so what does Scripture actually say about when Yeshua was resurrected? What time? Well, last Sunday, we looked at the gospel account of the women going to the tomb on the day we would call Easter Sunday. And does it say what time the resurrection occurred? Does it say it happened at sunrise? Would you be surprised to learn that none of the four gospels actually tell us what time? Jesus was resurrected. In fact, all four Gospels give a slightly different description of the events surrounding the arrival of the women at the tomb. For example, Matthew says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day, that could happen any time from sunset on, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Matthew mentions one angel who was there who announced Yeshua has already risen. Why are you looking for him? He's not here. He's already gone, right? Mark says, very early on the first day of the week, 
They came to the tomb when the sun had risen, past tense, right? Mark also says there was an angel inside the tomb who announced to them that Yeshua was already risen. He's already gone when they got there. Luke says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Luke now mentions two angels being present, and one of them gives the announcement again that Yeshua has already risen. He's already gone. Finally, John says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. She got there before sunset or sunrise, and she found the stone had already been rolled away. She doesn't even go in. She doesn't see that the body's gone. She just assumes that it is, and John doesn't mention an angel at all. And so if we put all four of these accounts together and we try to sort of synergize them and say, well, you know, we've got four different eyewitnesses telling different parts of the story. What's the whole story? Here's what we know is this. The women arrived at the tomb around sunrise. It might have been a little bit before. It might have been a little bit after. It might have been right at, but it was somewhere around sunrise. However, sometime before the women arrived, an earthquake had occurred, at least one angel showed up and rolled the stone away from the tomb, or maybe the stone rolled away by just some unseen power of God, and the angel sat on top of the stone, and the guards who witnessed this were terrified, they evidently passed out in fear, but we do not know specifically at what time this occurred. All we know is it had already happened by the time the women arrived at the tomb around dawn. And when the women arrive, if we put all the four stories together, they see two angels in the open tomb. Uh, One of them speaks to them and tells them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Yeshua is not here. He's already risen. And so again, John tells the women, tells us the women left home while it was still dark. The other gospels say they reached the tomb around sunrise, maybe a little before, maybe a little after, maybe right at sunrise. But it doesn't matter because one thing is certain according to all four accounts By the time the women arrive at the tomb, the report of the angels is the same. Yeshua has already risen sometime before you arrived. So, did he rise five minutes before they arrived? Five hours before they arrived? It doesn't specifically say. What we do know is he rose on the first day of the week, but as we said, the first day of the week for the Jews started at sunset on the sixth day of the week, what we would call Saturday night. So all we really know for certain by the scriptural account is that Yeshua rose from the dead sometime after sunset on Saturday night, what we would call Saturday night, and sometime before sunrise on what we would call Sunday morning. So as Gentiles who use the Gregorian calendar in a midnight-to-midnight clock system, we want to rule out the hours between sunset and midnight, Because that was Saturday, from our point of view, we argue. That's Saturday, not Sunday. But the Bible doesn't say Yeshua rose from the dead on Sunday. It said he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Now, for Yeshua's Jewish culture, those hours between sunset and midnight, they're part of the first day of the week. So think about this. If Yeshua rose from the dead, say at 7 p.m. on what we would call Saturday night, he still rose from the dead in the early minutes of what the ancient Jews would have called the first day of the week. I know this can be a little confusing, but if you can keep this straight in your mind, it makes a big difference in understanding our Hebrew roots. Because Yeshua made many predictions that he would rise on the third day, right? On the third day of I will rise. In fact, 99.9% of the time when he referred to his resurrection, that's the way he said it, on the third day. There's one troubling passage that differs from all of the other passages in Scripture, Matthew 12, 40. Yeshua says, For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, we've tried to sort of Explain that, because the timeline doesn't fit. He got buried on Friday, rose on Sunday. That's not three days and three nights. And so I've shared how ancient Jews sometimes counted any part of a day as a whole day. So we know Yeshua was dead part of Friday day. Before sunset happened, he was dead part of that time. He was dead all that night. 
He was dead all of Saturday day, and he was dead at least some part of Saturday night. But that's two days and two nights. Not three days and three nights. And even if we assume he rose sometime after sunrise, which isn't what the Gospels say, that's still just three days and still only two nights. It still doesn't fit three days and three nights. At best, we've got three days and two nights. So what do we do with this problem passage that doesn't seem to make sense? Well, when Luke records the exact same conversation, it goes down a little bit differently. He writes, Jesus said this, For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be a sign to this generation. He's just making a connection between the two signs. Yeshua doesn't spell out three days and three nights in Luke. He just refers to the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Well, actually, it can refer to several things, but we presume it's like just like Jonah was swallowed up by a fish, Yeshua would be swallowed up by the grave. Both of them would be presumed dead, only to appear alive again days later. And so what do we do with that? Well, Yeshua may have just been being poetic in the Matthew account, using a turn of a phrase, a figure of a speech, and Matthew wrote it down while Luke skipped it. He didn't decide to include it. However, because Luke records the conversation without the days and nights reference, and every other passage of Scripture where Jesus refers to his resurrection, he says, on the third day, Matthew's the only one where he doesn't say it that way, the obvious problem with the number of days and nights not working out anyway, some scholars say, and I'm inclined to agree, Yeshua probably only mentioned it the way Luke records it, the sign of Jonah. And then Matthew, or maybe some later scribe, tried to kind of help fill in the blanks with some extra details. You know, like Jonah, three days and three nights. You know, you know what he's saying, right? And perhaps they embellished a little bit, even though Yeshua never said it that way. And again, our understanding of the inerrancy of Scripture is that Scripture is inerrant in its original manuscripts. And 99.9% .9 of the copies we have are identical over the many years that they were copied by hand. But there are a few differences and a few discrepancies. And so other than this problematic account of Matthew 1240 that doesn't seem to make any sense because he wasn't dead for three days and three nights, every other passage of scripture, Yeshua never said it that way. He never said, I'm going to be dead for three days or I'm going to be dead for 72 hours. He never said that. He always said, on the third day, I will rise. And he did, in fact, do that. He's not dead for three days and three nights, but he absolutely does rise on the third day of the Feast of Passover. And that third day just happened to be the Feast of First Fruits that year. So again, if First Fruits, the Sunday that occurs during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, if that Sunday had occurred several days later in the week, I think he would have said on the fifth day. I will rise, or on the sixth day, I will rise. You know, not five days after I die, but on the fifth day, I will rise. The fifth day of Passover, or the third day of Passover. I think that's the true meaning of his prediction, I'm going to rise on the third day. Not that he meant it as literally 72 hours after I die. Now, with all that in mind, remember again, we've said Yeshua fulfilled the true meaning of the Passover dress rehearsal, not only to the exact day, but also to the exact hour. We've talked about how he entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan through the Messianic gate at the same time as the other Passover lambs were entering through the sheep gate. On Passover preparation day, the 14th of the month, the day the lambs are slain, we talked about how he was sent to be crucified at 9 a.m., the same time the morning sacrifice occurred. We talked about how the sky turned dark at noon, the same time the noon prayers were being offered at the temple. We talked about how he died at 3 p.m., the same time the evening sacrifice was happening at the temple. And then we talked about how he was buried and sealed in the tomb just before the start of the 15th. They wanted him buried before sunset when Sabbath began and before the Feast of Unleavened Bread began. So while it isn't specifically spelled out for us in Scripture, Here's something that makes sense to me. It's just kind of an intuitive Hebrew roots thing. I know this is kind of complicated, so I, I want to hit it one more time again. We know the high priest would send out his delegation just after sunset on the weekly seventh-day Sabbath that occurred during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what we would call Saturday night. And so since it happens after sunset, 
by Jewish calendar reckoning, that's the first few minutes of the day after the Sabbath, also known as the first day of the week, and in this case, it is also the Feast of First Fruits as well during 33 AD. So the group of priests, they would go out into a nearby field, and they would reach down into the soil, and they would pluck up a barley sheaf, the First Fruits wave sheaf, right? And by getting there after sunset, right at the very first few minutes of the Feast of First Fruits Day, while it's still dark, they could be sure that their gathering was indeed the first fruits of the harvest. So that's why they did that. So then think about this possibility for a moment, just this possibility. Doesn't it make sense that this would also be the same time God the Father reached down into the soil of the tomb and plucked Yeshua, the first fruits, from the soil, from the tomb. Paul tells us clearly, Yeshua is the first fruits of the harvest of God. He fulfilled the exact time and day of Passover. He fulfilled the exact day and time of unleavened bread. Doesn't it make sense that he would fulfill the exact time and day of first fruits as well? Shortly after sunset on the Sabbath, in the early morning hours of the first day of the week, early moments of the first day of the week, of the day of first fruits, on the third day of Passover, Jesus rises again. Could have happened at 6.41 p.m. Saturday night. Now, I can't prove that, of course. Nobody can disprove it either, but it makes sense to me. It fits with what Scripture actually says, that Yeshua rose from the dead on the first day of the week, on the third day of Passover. That's all true. And then, several hours later, 10 to 12 hours later, at sunrise, around 6 a.m., the women finally get to the tomb, and they find the stone's already been rolled away, the body's already gone, and the angels tell them, you shouldn't be looking for the living among the dead. Yeshua's not here. He is already risen from the dead. Now, John's gospel also tells us soon after her encounter with the angels in the tomb, Mary also encounters Yeshua, and she mistakes him for a gardener at first, and then he helps her recognize him. Here's, here's how it goes down in John's gospel. Jesus said to her, Mary... And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. She was like, grabbing a hold of him. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. So Mary's evidently so overjoyed, she's just hugging him. And she's holding him. She's clinging to him. She's not willing to let him go. She doesn't want to lose sight of him. Again, the last time she saw him, he was dead. She doesn't want him to be gone again. So remember, though, the high priest is supposed to take the barley sheaf of the first fruits that was harvested from the ground just after sunset the night before, and he's supposed to wave it before the Lord during the morning sacrifice at 9 a.m. He's also supposed to offer an unblemished lamb, oil, flour, and wine at that sacrifice. And so this collection of sacrificed items is very different from the normal morning sacrifice, but this is what was supposed to be done on the Feast of First Fruits. And all of these symbols are very familiar to us now with our Hebrew roots, right? The unblemished lamb, we know that represents Yeshua, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. The flour, of course, reminds us of matzah bread. We've studied how Scripture calls Yeshua the bread of life. He's the unleavened bread. He's the show bread. He's the bread of the presence. He's the manna that came down from heaven. He's the afikoman. He's the he that is to come. He's the broken bread served at the end of Passover. He's the bread Yeshua used when he said, this is my body broken for you. And then God said in Leviticus 23, in his instructions for this feast offering, the oil is supposed to be mixed with the flour. Well, oil is often used as a symbol for the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. The Holy Spirit descends upon Yeshua at his baptism. We know that Yeshua is full of the Holy Spirit. We know Yeshua is going to send his Holy Spirit to the disciples soon. In fact, 50 days after Resurrection Day at the Feast of Shavuot, also known as Pentecost. And finally, we have wine being offered. Remember the third cup of wine at the Passover, the cup of redemption, the wine Yeshua used when he referred to it as his blood, the blood of the Brit Chadashah, the new covenant. So we put all that together. You got the lamb, you got the wine, you got the flour, you got the oil, you got the sheaf of first fruits, all at this special morning sacrifice at 9 a.m. on the Feast of First Fruits on Resurrection Day, and it all just screams Yeshua, yeah? 
And so the priest waves the first fruit sheaf of the harvest before God, that's Yeshua. The sacrificed lamb is offered to God, that's Yeshua. The unleavened flour is mixed with oil and offered to God, that's Yeshua, full of the Holy Spirit. The wine is offered, that's Yeshua's blood of the new covenant. The new covenant has now begun. Now, remember, it was sometime shortly after sunrise, Mary finally encounters the risen Yeshua, and he tells her not to cling to him, because he has to go somewhere. Where does he have to go? He says, I have to still ascend to the Father. I haven't ascended to the Father yet. Well, why hasn't he already done that? You know, he's been awake for a while. He's been alive for a while. Why, why is he waiting to ascend to the Father? Well, again, it isn't expressly stated in Scripture, but if we properly understand our Hebrew roots, that all of these feasts, all of these moed, were dress rehearsals pointing to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, it becomes very clear. He was waiting to ascend to the Father until 9 a.m., the time of the morning sacrifice, the time of the first fruits offering on the Feast of First Fruits, and at the same time, the Jewish high priest was presenting the wave offering of the first fruits before God in the earthly temple. That's exactly when Yeshua, our first fruits, our permanent high priest, would present himself as the first fruits a wave offering of the Brit Chadasha, of the new covenant, the fulfillment of Passover, the fulfillment of unleavened bread, the fulfillment of first fruits. He waves before the Father in the heavenly temple at the same time. Here I am, Dad. At the same time, the priests were plucking up the first fruits offering from the field in the first moments of the first day of the week on the third day of Passover, Yeshua. Our first fruits was plucked up out of the tomb by the Father. And at the same time, the high priest was waving the sheaf of the first fruits offering before God in the earthly temple. Yeshua was waving himself before God the Father in the heavenly temple. That's a whoop glory moment for sure, right? So Yeshua fulfilled Passover to the very day, to the very hour. Yeshua fulfilled unleavened bread to the very day, to the very hour. Yeshua fulfilled first fruits to the very day, to the very hour. All three of these feasts, these divine appointments, these dress rehearsals, had been rehearsed for 1,500 years before Yeshua came. And now they've been ultimately fulfilled by Yeshua. And then it keeps getting better and better from there. If you look at the other four feasts of the Lord, Yeshua fulfilled Shavuot, what we call Pentecost. He did it to the very day. He did it to the very hour as well. Just as the Lord appeared on Mount Sinai for the first time in fire and wind, a sound of rushing wind in Pentecost, Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit descend upon the disciples with tongues of fire and a sound of mighty rushing wind. There's a direct connection to what was happening on Mount Sinai during the Exodus. And then we go down the list, right? We see that to the very day, to the very hour, he fulfilled that, and he's going to fulfill Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets or the Feast of Trumpets, and Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Nations. He's going to fulfill all of those to the very day and the very hour. The dress rehearsals have been happening now for almost 3,500 years, but he's going to fulfill all three of those fall feasts when he comes again the second time in the future. That's pretty exciting stuff, right? If that excites you, would you say, yeah, God? Yeah. Hebrew roots are important. For many, 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 many years in the church, we've erased our Hebrew roots, and we've said, no, 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 just read the New Testament. You don't need the Old Testament. That's the old stuff. You don't need the old stuff. You just need the new stuff. We've done a complete disservice to the church of Jesus Christ because we've missed out the context of what the New Testament is really about and what it's really talking about and what's really connected. And so the more we understand about our Hebrew roots, the better we are able to understand and interpret the New Testament and the closer we get to Jesus because we understand what was really being done, what was really going on, what was really being said. It's a Jewish person working from their Jewish faith in a Jewish culture, and that's how it all makes sense. Let's pray together as Joel and Al come and lead us in our closing song. Father God, uh, the more I dig into Hebrew roots, the more excited my faith becomes, the more jazzed I get about 
how you cross every T, how you dot every I. And even just something simple, on the third day I will rise again, on the third day I will rise again, on the third day, oh, on the third day. It makes so much sense when we put it in the right context. God, I pray for everyone hearing this message tonight that they would get excited about wanting to learn more about their Hebrew roots, that they would see the value of connecting all of these Old Testament dots with the New Testament faith that we participate in and that we don't any longer divorce Jesus from his Hebrew beginnings, that he was a Jewish person living in a Jewish culture, doing Jewish things and speaking the Jewish language and practicing the Jewish faith. God, we need to know that, and we need to understand it if we're really going to know Jesus. So I pray that you would help each of us do that, to just develop a, a super excitement about wanting to dig deeper into that Hebrew faith and see how it connects to us in Christianity. That's my prayer for all of us tonight, Lord. I pray for anyone who's listening tonight who maybe doesn't know what they believe about Jesus yet. And maybe as they hear this kind of stuff, they say, wow, what what are the odds of that? That can't happen by chance. That, That can't be a coincidence. That can't be an accident. Maybe there's something to that. That that feels like that'd have to be a miracle for all those things to line up on the exact day and the exact time. Maybe there's something to this Jesus stuff. If that's what your heart's telling you right now, that's, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit tapping on your heart, saying, yes, Jesus is real. This is real stuff. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus came to this earth to fulfill hundreds of prophecies about him, to prove that he really was divine. Nobody could have done everything he did the way he did it without being divine. He proved himself over and over and over and over again. And so maybe you would say tonight, I believe that. I have confidence that Jesus really is who the Bible says he is and that he really did everything the Bible says he did and that he's really going to do everything the Bible says he promised to do. I'm going to put my faith, my trust, my confidence in him. Jesus, I want you to be my God. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I trust you. You lead me, I'll follow you. And maybe you would say, Jesus, I also believe that you came and died on the cross. You paid the penalty for the sin of every human being that ever lived and ever will live. You were perfect. You never did anything wrong. And yet you said, I'm going to take the blame. I'm going to be the substitutionary atonement. I'm going to be the first fruits offering that redeems everyone else. Everyone else can be set free because I'm going to take the hit. You became our Savior in that way. And so, Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior today. I confess that I have sinned against God and I needed to be redeemed. I needed to have my sins atoned for. And so thank you for doing that for me, Jesus. I ask you, please be my personal Savior begin a personal relationship with me as my best friend, as my adopted brother, as my God, as my Savior, as my Lord. Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. Help me be a fully devoted follower of yours all the rest of my life. Help me trust you in every situation, every day of my life. Lead me in the path of righteousness. Show me what an abundant life is really supposed to look like. Give me that assurance of eternal life when this life is through. Jesus, thank you that you have already said your answer to those requests will be yes. We don't have to be worried or fearful that you'll say, no, you're not good enough. You've already said the answer is going to be yes. If you are faithful to confess your sins to him, he will be faithful to forgive you. He'll be your Lord and Savior. So if that's your prayer tonight, you want that relationship with Jesus, you can just say, me too, God. If you're watching online, type, me too, God. Me too. When Pastor Greg just prayed, that's what I want in my life, that assurance, that confidence of a relationship with God through Jesus. God, touch each one tonight in the way they most need to be touched by you. Solve whatever questions are in their heart. Help them find hope in whatever problems they're facing in life. Help them know that they're never alone, that you are always with them. You are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the one who sets all things right if we trust you. Help them all trust you tonight in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. We make a miracle. truth of who you are, that you have fulfilled every promise, and that you are true to your word. We love you. We praise you here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.